Thank you, Janiel. <clears throat> okay, so uh, I'm going to try to f follow follow Kelly up, if that's even uh, possible, with uh, trying to bring all of this together um, uh, a little bit beyond uh, the experimental testing to try to give a, a rough overview of, of uh, the different aspects uh, that are happening in this project and, and a, few, a little bit about the connection as well. So first I'd like to, of course, thank CEA for providing the funding for this project. And I, and I would also like to thank um, the, the Peer Center, especially Yusuf Bazorgnia, for uh, trying to keep all this together. And, and uh, there's uh, far too many uh, working group contributors that I would love to thank individually, but it would probably take a half an hour. So just moving moving on to the, the actual uh, working group list that, uh, that Kelly went through before. I don't want to go through the, the list, but the, the, the title of the talk does uh, include numerical modeling, which would suggest looking at working group 5, which is uh, the structural modeling, and then WG6, which is loss modeling. But uh, I, I, also want, I also want to talk a little bit about the, the interactions to give more of an overview of everything that's uh, really going on uh, other than the experimental testing. So to start, I'm, I'm going to define our, our end goals and the numerical framework we're using. And then, as mentioned, I did do, uh, I did do work on the uh, ATC 110 project uh, alongside with Kelly. And uh, one of the first things I want to do to kind of give a broad idea or a, 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 yeah, a broad idea of what we're really looking for is I want to uh, go through a few trial study results that uh, was kind of one of my first assignments as I moved from uh, ATC 110 to uh, working on the Pure CEA project at Stanford. And then um, after going through that, I'll just talk a little bit about uh, how we're trying to set up this, this numerical program, uh, defining what to analyze by looking at different building variants, and also a little bit about index configurations, and then uh, also moving in to uh, how to analyze them talking a little bit about gr the ground motions that, uh, that were currently being that are being developed for the project, a little bit about structural modeling, and then uh, just uh, talking a, a little bit about uh, what we're working with right now in terms of damage and consequence modeling for older wood frame. And then I'll, I'll just shortly conclude after that uh, uh, with uh, just a few ongoing efforts and challenges uh, that, we're, that we're working on to push the, the project forward. So the, by looking at this, this uh, diagram here, the main, the main goal, as that was already mentioned, is uh, we're looking at adjustment factors to relate the change in seismic damage uh, between existing houses on cripple walls down to the retrofit. And, and also, as, as a secondary consideration, we are trying to understand uh, what the actual loss functions may be in order, in order so to, to relate what's happening when we go from existing cripple wall down to retrofit, as well as understanding how that retrofit may compare to an equivalent house without a, vul a vulnerability. And I'm sure everyone in this room is quite familiar, but we are using, uh, to, to estimate performance, we are using the uh, building specific uh, pr uh, PBE framework that's, uh, that's modeled, uh, essentially implementing the FEMA P58 approach. Where we're, we're beginning with uh, analyzing, defining building variants, and then combining that with an appropriate uh, site hazard curve. And, uh, sele and by selecting uh, appropriate ground motions, we can run structural models, getting uh, representative distributions of EDP response, such as drift and acceleration, and also an estimate of the collapse fragility. And then moving on to the more inter interesting portion of the performance assessment, we have to define a damageable inventory, where in the case for wood frame, this is uh, uh, can be seen by defining the exterior wall material, the interior wall material, and also the density of the interior walls. And then we can take this damage inventory and assign damage fragilities and consequence functions to it in order to relate structural response to damage and then eventually economic considerations, where we can uh, end up with the final seismic performance assessment. So just to go through a little bit about this trial study, I, I was really happy to hear uh, that Kelly already explained uh, kind of the, the range of strengths we were looking at in the ATC 110 project. So, so th these are the preliminary results that I used with the existing uh, P58 uh, tools that are available. Um, uh, in this case, we're using SP3. Um, so the main idea here is that we're just going to look at some results um, uh, with a, a strong and stiff superstructure, which this one was uh, this one was used to uh, look at the to put the most demands on the cripple wall structure, uh, the cripple wall itself uh, during guideline development. And then also we'll look at the, the very we a weak and flexible superstructure that's comprised mostly or comprised of horizontal siding and gypsum. And this one, <clears throat> and this one was used uh, more for, for understanding uh, what the what the uh, the potential of shifting damage uh, upstairs was. So just to start uh, from the ATC 110 aspect, 
Um, we're looking at collapse fragilities, which was the primary objective in the project. And you can see you can see the MCE annotated there. So if we just compare the solid lines to the dashed lines, you can see the effect of the retrofit and also the effect on the uh, MCE collapse intensity. So now when we move to the new project, <clears throat> the PRCA project, now now we're looking at uh, loss curves uh, representing you know mean repair cost versus intensity measure. We're just just uh, clearly now you can you can see uh, a similar comparison can be made between the existing and retrofit where uh, understanding understanding this uh, this change in, in coming up with modification factors uh, to quantify this transition is the primary objective and I just I just really quickly want, want to go go through um, uh, talking a little bit about expected annual loss and a, a, a few different ways of thinking about uh, what we're after here uh, not really paying too much attention to the actual values the, the main idea is if we start at the existing level you can see that the expected annual loss um, loss values are different. Obviously, they're not the same structure. And then also by adding the retrofit, we're also reducing down to different levels, which is which is one of the challenges that we're going to have to try to understand. And then just by really quickly uh, disaggregating this, you can see that also the sources of losses are, are much different. We can see the orange section is representing collapse. So for the strong case, the, the, collapse, uh, the collapse portion is much less. And with the strong superstructure, most of the expected annual loss is occurring in the cripple walls. Where just very briefly, if we go to the more flexible case, you can see a similar reduction in the contribution of collapse, but now we, we have expected annual loss uh, controlled by uh, partition and finish damage. So this is just to kind of illustrate some of the things that we're going to have to uh, deal with as we move forward to this. And the main question now and for the rest of my talk is how can we uh, refine and expand this process to apply to California? So I'll talk a, a little bit about uh, the building variants, and these come in, in different flavors. Uh, and, and a lot of this work is credited to Evan Reese of Working Group 2, um, where basically a primary variant just broadly classifies the structure, which could be age of construction, number of stories, uh, which really doesn't, uh, doesn't get into any specifics. Secondary variants can be observable, such as the exterior siding material and also the cripple wall height. And then there's also uh, things that we're considering in this project that are unobservable secondary variants, where things that may not even be... Uh, be directly considered, but they actually exist in reality. And this could be uh, the presence of sheathing behind the exterior materials, and also the, and importantly, the construction quality and condition um, <coughs> of the actual structure. And, and I don't want to go through the entire list, but I just want to sh point out a few things. We are targeting three different eras of construction, where um, the earlier eras are, are, are governed by a lath and plaster interior with a more unbolted sill, or typically more of an unbolted sill. And then the, the later the later eras have uh, gypsum wallboard and anchor bolts in them. And the only other thing I wanted to point out here, because I, I think I have to keep moving, is um is one interesting thing is we're looking at different classifications of triple walls. I was actually uh, which which can be constant height, uneven height, and also a zero height condition where you have a uh, some some height such as four foot at one end of the house that's on a slope, and then it actually goes all the way to. Uh, to the uh, floor diaphragm being uh, positively anchored right to the uh, the perimeter foundation wall. And one in interesting thing is uh, yesterday at the poster session, I actually was speaking with someone that had a, a five foot to two foot transition on their house, and I, I couldn't even believe that uh, they brought that up because we weren't even talking about cripple walls. Anyway, so <laughs> so so um, so. Uh, Long story short, our current scope, we're currently working within a, a proposed variant range of around 1,000 um, considering, considering a, a bunch of different factors. So now, uh, I won't spend too much time on this because Kelly already mentioned uh, the, the, the home databases, there's the home configuration uh, collection that uh, Colin Blaney and I painstakingly measured. Um, and and uh, since we don't have any more data than that, I only want to make one comment that uh, instead of co combining this uh, house data uh, with upfront material strength, since we're going to be looking at so much more uh, uh, range of materials and variability, we're actually I, uh, we've been working with extracting uh, just just the uh, relative uh, wall density information. And one interesting point is that uh, just looking at, at the average one house data that we're showing so far, the house that they actually used in the Curie Wood Frame project is fitting uh, uh, very well on on numerous uh, parameters. Uh, is a is an average house, so that's a quite quite fortunate or, or quite quite uh, interesting that that happened. 
So now I'm going to move on to uh, just kind of how we're going to try to start analyzing these buildings, starting with uh, the ground motions. <coughs> and, um, and this is uh, in this this work should be credited to our working group three uh, group leaders, Sylvia Mazzoni and uh, Yusuf uh, Bazornia. And, uh, and basically, we're, we're working with ten site locations, four in um, four in Northern California, six in Southern California, with uh, two different soil types. And, and the one thing I just want to draw your, to your attention is that each the, the last column there is actually the uh, the governing uh, design loading uh, for different uh, ATC 110 plan sets. It's showing that there's actually going to be a range of details and uh, combinations of seismic hazard across different sites. Now if we look at one example site, um, we are working with a uh, uniform hazard spectra. We're taking San Francisco as an example. We're, we're looking at uh, 10 different intensities from 15 year return period to 2500 year where each intensity is um, approximately 50, 50 ground motion pairs uh, scaled to match the appropriate uniform hazard spectra. So now I'd, I'd like to talk a little bit about the modeling. Uh, we are using uh, the OpenSeas platform in the Pure CEA project. We were using the Timber 3D um, program previously in ATC 110, but, uh, but we are making the switch. And, uh, but we're using the same general modeling scheme where this is an example for a, a two-story, or I'm sorry, a, a one-story one uh, house on two-foot cripple walls. And it's basically a, a shear spring macro, uh, macro element uh, concept where we have, uh, we have the, the green elements are, are the vertical framing members that also act as P-delta columns and in, in support the, uh, the floor and roof diaphragms where the blue and red elements correspond up to the, uh, to the assumed floor plan. And then, within each of these, uh, within each of these springs, we can we can calibrate material materials based on subassembly testing in order to uh, essentially put the pieces together for the house that we're we're looking at. And then I'm going to talk. A, a, I don't want to get into too many details. I just would like to uh, bring up one one uh, one interesting thing that we've been working on is the his, history of modeling of wall materials. Um, we're currently using a, a pinching four material that's uh, using a two spring in parallel approach and this is to capture uh, capture behavior um, all the way from small displacements to large displacements which is very important uh, for, for uh, doing performance assessment uh, from the onset of cracking all the way to collapse and uh, just as one example if we have if we have the combined backbone or a, 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 a target backbone uh, material sh shown in blue here it's just showing that that backbone is actually comprised of two different springs with different weighting uh, to, to have a little more control <coughs> over the cyclic data. And I just want to give one, I could do so many comparisons, but I just want to at least show that we are, we are using it and getting pretty good results. This is a, this is a, a sample calibration to a 2x12 two, two foot cripple wall with horizontal wood siding, recently conducted at uh, UCSD. And, uh, and just the main point is we're capturing, uh, this is only one material, but we are uh, able to capture uh, the, the large displacement behavior quite well. And also if you look at the, zo the zoomed in area, we're able to, uh, to make the transition from the, the small cycles uh, out to the large ones. And this is similar for other, um, other materials. I just don't really have, uh, I don't really have uh, time to keep going uh, into it. Okay. <clears throat> And I'm um, sorry, I'm realizing I'm going a little fast. Um, so now moving into the more performance assessment part of this this project, one of the one of the main challenges is is the fact that we're trying to use uh, use uh, the FEMA P58 methodology, essentially a, a new methodology for old buildings. So it's um, so we can't just uh, seamlessly transition into just using the existing FEMA P58 database um, since there's uh, everything was geared much more towards modern construction such as uh, stucco and OSB and in, uh, in interior gypsum. So we have been doing some work working uh, uh, working alongside with the, the testing group to uh, just try, try to expand uh, expand and adjust any information we have in order to, to more reliably uh, assess the damage of some of these uh, different materials. And then uh, also uh, more uh, more uh, appropriate for or more particular to our project, looking at these short cripple walls, a lot of the a lot of the stucco testing that we're seeing is uh, is allowing us to get uh, is, is allowing us to really identify the lack of uh, drift compatibility with stucco and some other materials, and, and just essentially allowing us to 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 revisit uh, what we would think uh, a default. FEMA, FEMA P58 fragility would achieve 
um, in terms of what we're learning from the recent testing. And then uh, I'm going to move to my the, the part of the project that I'm most excited for. Uh, this is dealing with the economic consequences, and we are trying to um, we are trying to put on a, uh, a claims adjuster damage workshop that's set for uh, currently for February, and and this is going to to get uh, get input from from numerous uh, claim uh, claims adjusters with earthquake damage experience. And, and the, the main idea is to get repair cost estimates in a range of damage from first cracking all the way to complete replacement for a number of different materials. Where is, uh, in, and we can kind of look at the benefits of this in two, uh, kind of twofold is, is uh, one we can, we're, we're, de uh, we're defining, uh, <clears throat> we're defining uh, uh, damage states in line with uh, FEMA P58 where applicable to allow for a comparison of, of what we already know. And then, in, in uh, probably more importantly, we, we are developing uh, case study information packages that target materials with large knowledge gaps. And this is really going to attempt to expand the applicability uh, of uh, using this kind of framework. And then also, we'll be asking uh, survey questions, which is just to, which is uh, trying to utilize the experience data of, of some of these claims adjusters, where where one one example question would be, you know, if they've ever experienced a, a, a uh, an insured cripple wall that's failed, that's ever replaced, or if it's always, uh, or if it's always kind of a complete loss scenario, and things of that sort. So I'm going to just talk a little bit about some some ongoing work. As we're collecting these uh, lo loss curves and updating updating our, our test information database, and also uh, getting more information about the loss modeling, we're going to start uh, collecting a lot of these different loss curves. And uh, in one of the big questions will be, um, <clears throat> you know, uh, l looking at how, how to appropriately weight some of, some of these different combinations to reflect the building stuff. And one example of this would be uh, the different cripple wall uh, classifications I showed with the uneven heights and uh, the level, uh, level heights and the ones that go, go to zero. You know, w one interesting, uh, you know, question to ask would be, <clears throat> you know, how, how would we combine all of that information, keeping all materials the same, but how do we combine all of that information for a, a, a single set of curves that just represent uh, a building that just has a cripple wall, regardless of what the, the actual detailing is? So, <clears throat> so some of the work that's actually being done uh, by a by a master student in uh, at Stanford is actually going through uh, the CEA uh, earthquake bracing bolt photo database, which is a uh, which is uh, one of the only sources that we know of getting this kind of specific information, where it consists of over five thousand. I think Janiel mentioned possibly seven thousand now um, homes specifically with cripple walls and anchorage deficiencies. So it's allowing for at least uh, more explicit information to be to be obtained uh, rather than what's usually connected or what's usually connect collected uh, in in a building stock survey. And then finally, uh, b before I finish, uh, <clears throat> one other issue is going to be the treatment of modeling uncertainty, where, where regardless of, or aside from looking at uh, deterministic variant combinations, we're also going to be interested in, in properly quantifying the, the material variation modeling assumptions for, a, for essentially a, a single uh, set of uh, uh, variant se uh, settings. And, um, and one thing that's currently being done with a, a, one of our with our working group five partners, who is uh, Henry Burton and Zhang Zheng Yi, that's uh, probably going to tell me I have to stop talking soon, um, is uh, is they're working on developing uh, surrogate modeling workflows um, in order to quantify uh, the uncertainty for select variants. And uh, and that that's all I have. I hope I at least uh, gave some interest. I think I went a little fast, but uh, that that's that's my overview of the kinds of things that we're working on to. Uh, to extend this uh, uh, into completion. So I'd like to thank you. Thanks.